Welcome to our webinar, International EMC Product Approvals. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar is being given by MET Laboratories. MET is a leader in the testing of electrical and electronic equipment for environmental hardiness, product safety, and electromagnetic compatibility. MET operates world-class labs in Baltimore, Maryland, Santa Clara and Union City, California, Austin, Texas, and also runs operations in China, Taiwan, and Korea. This webinar will run about 45 minutes with an additional 15 minutes for questions and answers. Due to the number of registrants, all attendees will have their phones muted. If you have a question, please type it in the questions area of your control panel. We will attempt to answer all questions at the end. If you are having technical difficulties, you can contact us the same way or call us at 410-935-6053. That's 410-935-6053. And we will try to resolve it quickly. Just a quick note on other upcoming events. Later this month, MET is hosting a NEB testing seminar in Santa Clara, California. In May, we are hosting an automotive EMC webinar and seminars on testing military and medical products. You can register for these events at www.metlabs.com. Today's webinar is being presented by Assad Bajwa. Assad is director of METS EMC Lab. At this point, I will hand over the presentation to Assad. Thank you, Benavi. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Assad. Uh, today, we are going to talk about the global compliance of approvals with the special emphasis on the EMC uh, aspect of the compliance. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to discuss uh, the compliance needs, uh, the testing requirements, and how do they compare with the uh, uh, with the, with the uh, compliance uh, requirements uh, around the globe, uh, with a special emphasis on uh, some of the challenges uh, which manufacturers have to go through who are looking for the worldwide approval. Here is a brief outline of my presentation. Uh, we'll start with the uh, brief introduction of what the homologation means. Uh, we will go over the testing uh, requirements. Uh, we'll talk about the MRA, especially uh, in context of the uh, the global approval uh, with the European Union and the Asia Pacific. Uh, uh, We'll talk about the uh, some additional uh, countries, including some of the Middle Eastern countries. Okay, uh, the word homologation comes from uh, word homologate. In other words, what it means is the to officially certify or to official officially approve. In compliance words, uh, what it means is to have a product certified, have a product tested, certified, and approved for all aspects of the compliance, whether it's safety. EMC, radio, telecommunication, so on and so forth. In some uh, rare cases, it could also involve the environmental aspect of the testing. So once the product has gone through all the required testing and approval process, that process is collectively referred as uh, uh, homologation when it is applied to uh, the worldwide approval. Uh, starting with the, the approval process, uh, the very first thing I want to mention is what sort of testing a product may have to go through. Depending upon the kind of the product, uh, the kind of the function a product may have, uh, the products may have to go through telecommunication testing. Uh, if they have any telecommunication uh, functions, like if a product hooks up to uh, PSTN uh, or it's, uh, uh, for example, a fax or analog modem, uh, 
Other cases, if a, if a product has a radio uh, capability, it's a wireless device, it would have to go through the applicable radio standards for a given uh, nation or a country. Uh, in addition, EMC testing applies. Uh, in many cases, many uh, countries require safety testing. Uh, some countries require specific absorption rate testing. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, in some cases, environmental testing is required as well. Uh, looking at the overall picture, uh, looking at the requirements worldwide, uh, if we kind of try to generalize the kind of certification and approvals uh, uh, into different categories, uh, we can divide them into three groups. Uh, one, verification, uh, which is done uh, in the cases where uh, product does not pose a, a serious hazard uh, to the other products in the intended environment. In some other cases, uh, depending on the product kind and the nation or the country, uh, this product will be placed on the market. Product may just need self-declaration by the manufacturer, whereas manufacturer could choose to do that either based on the analysis or on testing done by, uh, an, by an accredited lab. In some other cases, uh, based on the product kind and uh, the country, it, this will be placed on the market. Product may have to go through actual certification process where testing would be required and at the same time uh, product will have to go through uh, a thorough review uh, for the approval. Compliance can be demonstrated by uh, the easiest way is to go through testing. Testing could be done uh, by the lab in, in country. When I mention in country, I'm talking in context of a manufacturer in US who is selling to uh, the countries abroad, like Asia, Europe, and other parts of the world. Uh, some countries still require in-country testing, like uh, many of the South American countries. Other countries have walked away from that idea for several reasons, like uh, Korea, BSMI, or uh, Vietnam, where in the past they required in-country testing. However, now they accept, based on various MRA signs, uh, the testing done by the labs in USA and some other nations. Uh, in some cases, Compliance could be uh, demonstrated either by the review of the testing to done to the foreign standards. In some in other cases, compliance could be uh, demonstrated by review of the product to the national standard uh, done by the lab in other nations. So one of these options could be used depending upon or could be applied depending upon which market segment this product is going to be placed on and that country and that nation may have some additional requirement uh, above and beyond just mentioned above. Uh, looking globally, uh, just a quick overview, as the compliance awareness is increasing, as markets around the world are opening up, uh, products from one country uh, being in, manufactured in one country are being sold around the globe. Uh, people are trying to, ca uh, to capture much larger market segment beyond uh, the country of the origin of the product, that uh, requires or that needs uh, a kind of the approval process where manufacturer could, uh, in an efficient way, get the approval in a manner that he should he or she should be able to sell the product to a large number of the nation around the globe. Uh, Without going into too much detail, I have a list of some of the countries and some uh, some market segments where uh, those nations have very established uh, compliance approval process, namely Australia, China, Taiwan, Japan, uh, Middle East, uh, Russia, uh, the, Asia, the Asia Pacific uh, nations, uh, Korea, for example. Um, many of these nations have very well established uh, a compliance approval process and as we go through this presentation we'll be exploring uh, some of these nations and uh, we'll also talk about uh, the testing requirements for these nations and we'll talk about some of the challenges the manufacturer in US and around the globe has to go through when they are trying to uh, meet the compliance need of these nations. Uh, it will be unfair to talk about homologation and the global compliance without mentioning uh, the mutual recognition agreements or MRAs as they are generally referred to. Uh, these are the MRAs which are signed by the US government uh, with many of the world nation and or the, uh, and or the economies. Uh, three of them are very uh, relevant to the topic in hand today. 
Uh, the very first one on my list is the US EU MRA. Second one is the Asia Pacific Cell MRA. And the third one is the US Japan MRA. And in the next few slides, we'll explore some of these MRAs and we'll see how they have impacted the global compliance today as we see. The US EU MRA, which was signed in 1998, uh, it includes uh, it includes the, uh, the, all the EU uh, member nations. The idea of this MRA is that the testing done by the approved lab under this MRA in the United States, uh, the testing done by those labs will be accepted for the scope of this uh, MRA by the European Union and vice versa. For example, uh, an ID, an ID product which will fall under electromagnetic compatibility directive. Uh, now the U.S. labs are allowed to uh, perform testing, and the U.S. labs are being uh, approved if the U.S. labs choose to do so as conformity assessment bodies under this MRA by 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 NIST, where these labs can perform the testing and these labs can act as uh, uh, as uh, as conformity assessment bodies. Uh, and issue and, and issue the notifying body opinion where applicable. So this has made uh, the testing done by the U.S. labs and have made them a lot more acceptable for the European Union. And uh, same applies uh, the other way around. The next uh, MRA uh, which is worth mentioning is the apex cell MRA. Uh, again, this one was signed in 1998. Uh, the 20 member, 21 member nations are eligible to participate in this MRA, meaning if they choose to join the uh, conformity assessment process uh, under the rules of this MRA, they can, they can become, they are eligible to become part of this uh, 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 conformity assessment process. Uh, this process is being implemented in two phases. The phase one covers the our test labs. Uh, what it means is the testing done by uh, the U.S. labs. Who, who are approved as conformity? Who are approved as conformity assessment bodies for these nations? So the test reports from those U.S. labs will be accepted by uh, the member nation of this uh, this MRA, and based on the review of these reports by the U.S. lab, uh, approval could be granted uh, where applicable uh, for, for 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 the product uh, tested by the U.S. lab. The part two of this MRA, which is referred as phase two, uh, that is more of a certification process, like similar to uh, the TCB process we have in USA, uh, which is uh, done uh, under the mandate by FCC. Uh, the certification process, basically what it means is uh, that the conformity assessment bodies and or the certification bodies who are part of the phase two, they can not only perform testing, uh, they can also accept the reports by uh, other approved labs and do the review and issue the uh, uh, appropriate approvals uh, for the certification of the product. Uh, exploring further, uh, under the phase one at the moment, we have the following nations which are listed. Uh, Australia, the accrediting body or the governing body for this program is the Australian Communication and Media Authority. For Canada, it's Industry Canada. For uh, Taiwan, uh, there are two different bodies who are actively involved with the, uh, with the approval process, uh, namely NCC, which is National Communication Commission, and the second one, which is known as DSMI. And as we go through this, these slides, we'll look, look at the differences uh, between NCC's role versus the DSMI role and see uh, how the product has to go through one or the other based on the kind of the product uh, we are talking about. For Singapore, the body, the cool body is IDA. For Korea, uh, it's the Radio Research Lab under the Korean Communication Commission. For Hong Kong, it's the Office of Telecommunication Authority. And Vietnam, it's the Ministry of Communication, or commonly known as MIC. Uh, I'm having slight technical difficulties. Uh, Uh, just bear with us for a second. We are having slight technical difficulty here.
Okay, uh, folks, uh, apologies for this uh, slight in interruption. Uh, well, uh, starting back where we stopped, uh, the phase two, which is the certification process, uh, at the moment there are four nations who are part of this uh, phase two certification process uh, under these uh, MRAs. Canada, which is uh, being governed under the Industry Canada, then Singapore by IDA, and uh, Hong Kong, and very recently Japan, uh, US MRA, uh, under that MRA, uh, the labs in U.S., after they complete the approval process, they could become the certification authorities. And as we get to the more detail on the Japan uh, approval process, I will explain the process further. Okay. Uh, the main focus of my presentation is to, from the angle uh, where the manufacturer in U.S. are trying to sell the products uh, worldwide. However, I thought it was uh, probably relevant to very briefly mention uh, what the approval process is for the North America, especially keeping in mind if we have uh, the listeners on the line who are interested in selling their products to uh, North America, uh, namely United States and uh, Canada. Very briefly, uh, for the U.S., the, uh, the rules and regulations are for the digital devices and, and as well as the radio devices. Uh, which are commonly referred as regulatory requirements, are being governed by FCC, Federal Communication Commission. Uh, for Canada, it's uh, Industry Canada. Uh, the key difference from many other nations uh, is that uh, US and Canada just requires emissions testing as far as the EMC, electromagnetic compatibility aspect of the testing is con uh, concerned. Uh, and there are three different routes for compliance, verification, declaration of compliance, and certification. Uh, depending on the product category, uh, your product may fall one of these. And uh, then uh, it's worth mentioning the TCB program where uh, many labs like uh, you, uh, like MET labs who are part of the TCB program where they can perform the testing. At the, at the same time, they can accept the test results by the approved lab and issue the certificates on the behalf of FCC. Uh, for the, uh, for especially for the for the virus products. Uh, another thing worth mentioning would be the RBOC requirements, which is not the regulatory requirements. However, uh, if a manufacturer plans to sell their product to uh, the RBOC or carriers in United States, uh, they will have to meet the FCC requirements, uh, applicable FCC requirements. At the same time, they will have to meet the uh, custom requirements by uh, these RBOCs. And generally, these RBOCs require testing to the genetic standards, uh, which go by, uh, which are commonly uh, known as uh, uh, NEBS testing program. Uh, two or three of two, two of the main uh, standards which are commonly used are GR1089, and the other one for environmental testing is the GR63. Uh, talking about the Europe US MRA which we mentioned earlier uh, to, to truly do justice uh, with the European compliance requirement it could be a topic of its own and it could take several hours to uh, cover all aspects of the uh, European requirement however I will try to very briefly summarize the requirement for Europe uh, the way the compliance process is uh, organized in Europe uh, by the European Union, uh, the, the requirements, the compliance requirements are, are divided into different directives uh, which are listed on the Europa webpage. Uh, there are, there is EMC directive, there is a radio and telecommunication directive, there are other lesser known directives like a machinery directive, directive. Uh, 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 there are uh, 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 low, low voltage directives, so on and so forth. And all these directives uh, cover some aspects of the product. However, not all of them are applicable to all kinds of products. Uh, very, very uh, generally speaking, for digital devices, uh, the most commonly applicable directive would be the EMC directive, which will cover both EMC and immunity testing. And uh, the way the testing is uh, uh, is organized is uh, under each directive, there is a list of the harmonized standards. Uh, there are multiple options for compliance. The easiest way which a large number of manufacturers choose to use is uh, by testing the product to the harmonized standard. 
However, there are other options uh, where manufacturer could use uh, uh, no defined body or a conformity assessment body uh, for special needs. But, uh, but for large number of cases, people will go with the harmonized standard. Uh, the main difference with, between the U.S. and the European requirement is that uh, unlike the U.S., uh, the compliance for Europe would require both emission and the even of Uh, from this point on, uh, I will be covering uh, several of the countries, uh, some of which are part of the uh, uh, the phase one and phase two MRA uh, uh, of uh, some of the three MRAs I mentioned earlier. Uh, due to the time constraint, I may end up skipping some of the uh, l l lesser, I didn't mean to uh, belittle any of the nations. Uh, just because of the sake of the time, we may uh, skip some of the nations which are not very frequently requested. Uh, starting with Australia, uh, the, the governing body there which, uh, which oversees the compliance requirement is the ACMA. Uh, up till recently, there were two main marks uh, which were required for the product, CTIC mark and ATIC mark. Uh, CTIC mark generally covered the EMC aspect and the ATIC mark was more of applicable for the telecom telecommunication product. Uh, as of July, uh, from July 12, uh, from July 1st of 2012, uh, ACMA is uh, moving away from uh, separate CTIC and ATIC marks and it will be replaced with RCM mark uh, which will cover them both. Uh, however, uh, briefly mentioning, uh, as part of the phase one MRA, uh, the IT product, radio products, and tele telecommunication products require testing to the applicable Australian standards, and testing could be done by the approved CAS uh, by NIST in the United States, and the Australian bodies uh, will accept those test results. Uh, in some cases, uh, in some cases, uh, testing uh, in some. My, my, my apologies. In some cases, uh, there will be requirement of the uh, approval. In some other cases, our uh, testing has to be, uh, the product has to be just verified and listed. Uh, however, in either case, uh, there has to be have a local rep in Australia uh, in order to, for the approval to complete. Uh, the next biggest challenge, which I want to spend a little bit extra time, and I have several slides to cover, Austra uh, co uh, cover is uh, South Korea. South Korea is uh, part of the Apex LMRA. Uh, before South Korea became uh, part of this Apex LMRA, uh, the manufacturer would uh, have to send their products to Korea for in-country testing, and it came with a lot of challenges, and the uh, manufacturer had to go through a lot of obstacles to go through the compliance process. This process was not only very costly, at the same time it was very inefficient, especially considering the time uh, it would take to send somebody to get, go through the testing and at the same time if there were uh, up, uh, if there were uh, non-compliance issues which will take several months to fix and go back and forth and uh, complete the testing process. Since the FXL MRA has been signed, many of the U.S. labs have uh, been approved by NIST which uh, based on that, they can perform testing, and MetLab is one of the uh, early labs who signed up for the Apex LMRA. Uh, the, the compliance program is being governed by the Radio Research Lab, and the, uh, which is part of the KCC, Korean Communication Commission. Uh, over the last several years, uh, Koreans have, uh, Korean authorities have made several changes to their compliance process. Uh, they started with the KCC mark, which uh, was replaced by AC mark, which is shown on the right-hand side of uh, my uh, my presentation. Uh, that change took place in as of January uh, 2011. Uh, up till recently, uh, the compliance was organized. Uh, the compliance program was organized uh, very differently, and uh, I have two sli two two slides, the following two slides, to go over how the reorganization of the compliance for Korea has been taken place. At the same time, uh, another challenge, uh, especially for the labs who, perform, labs who perform the conformity assessment bodies is the ever-changing regulations for Korea. Uh, Koreans have, uh, since this program started, have made one change after the other to their regulations. Uh, the biggest challenge for the labs 
they come is to keep themselves up to date the latest Korean testing requirements and the bigger challenge is to make sure their uh, their their uh, accreditation the accrediting bodies like A2LA and NAVLAB has the correct uh, standard listed on their scope so that they could continue performing testing to uh, the Korean requirements. So uh, this slide covers how the old certification system was organized. Uh, the the certification system was divided into four parts. Uh, four parts: type approval, which covered the telecommunication aspects of the testing; uh, EMC registration, which generally covered all the ITE products; uh, type registration, and type authorization was reserved for the radio devices, depending upon the radio uh, product. The frequency range it operated, uh, the function it performed, and the power it uh, emitted. It was determined whether the product will fall under type registration or type authorization. However, uh, uh, re very recently, the Korean authorities have walked away from the system. The new reorganized system consists of three options. Option, option number one is the certification of the conformity. Uh, the second one, is, second one is the registration of compatibility which applies more so to the EMC aspect. The first one applies more so to the telecommunication and the radio aspect of the radio functionality of the products. And the final one is the in, in term of the conformity, which is for the cases where there are no defined rules uh, for special products, where in those cases, uh, manufacturer could choose to apply for in term of conformity, and in this case, uh, they may even refer to some foreign standards if there are no national standards available due to the un due to the unique unique kind of the product. Uh, for further information, I will highly recommend going to uh, the web page listed here and at the end of the Korean section, which is basically a portion of the radio research uh, lab. That lab has a very detailed inform uh, that uh, my apologies. That web page has very detailed information on all kind of uh, the products, they have provided a uh, very thorough list of the products which will fall under one of these product categories. So if there is a question about if your product falls uh, in one of these, uh, you can simply go to that page and uh, pull through the list and see uh, which particular option will work better for uh, the product you are trying to go to Korea. Uh, once Testing is performed by a conformity assessment body like NetLab. Uh, the approval process starts where uh, MATLAB will help uh, the manufacturer who wish to use MATLAB uh, for the approval process uh, in addition to the testing. Uh, at that stage, depending upon which one of these categories your product falls in, for example, uh, compatibility of registration, uh, we will take your product, uh, we will perform testing, we will submit the report. A uh, certain portion of the report uh, would have to go through the translation to the Korean language. We will request you to provide a user manual, internal external photos of the uh, your product. If you allow MATLABs to do that, we can provide the service to take the pictures. Uh, we request a component uh, block diagram, circuit diagram. Uh, where uh, at the same time we will represent, uh, we'll, we will need a letter uh, on, the, on company letterhead who would be your local representative. Uh, in some cases, MATLAB can help arrange a local representative uh, uh, for the manufacturers. And finally, of course, uh, the compatibility registration form. Uh, similar, slightly different are the requirements for other uh, uh, product categories. Uh, the Korean uh, authorities are also quite picky about the, the label, the way the label will be affixed on a product. Uh, the, the, the size of the label can be uh, enlarged or sh shrunk. However, the aspect ratio has to be maintained as uh, shown on this slide at the, at the bottom, bottom half of the slide. Uh, regarding the color of the label, it's highly recommended to use the indigo uh, color. Uh, however, if you look through the logo designing guide, which is also listed on the web page, uh, and I, will, I have a link to that web page on the next slide. Uh, uh, that link will mention that in some cases where due to the contrast of the color of the product, manufacturer may use a different color, like a gold color, for example, uh, for the logo. 
Uh, this particular slide uh, covers and explains how the KCC ID works. Uh, oftentimes, we get questions, so I thought I will put some information there to explain what this ID means. Uh, this could, this could uh, be uh, up to 26 uh, letters and or numbers. KCC means the product is approved by KCC. Uh, the letter C after the, the first dash indicates uh, what kind of approval process the product has to go through. C would obviously signify certification. R is for R is for registration, and I is for interim. Uh, the number three, which is will indicate the kind of the testing, uh, or in other words, if I could say the product type, what kind of testing the product has to gone, has gone through, whether it was wireless or radio, telecommunication, EMC, or device had the multiple functionality where EMC testing had to be done and or the wireless testing had to be done, or in some cases telecommunication interface testing had to be performed. Now the next one is the M, which means uh, who is the applicant, whether it's the manufacturer, is it the importer, or is it the seller. Uh, the last 14 digit are for the uh, the unique code uh, of the product, which could also include the the product model name in addition to some other letters and or number. And uh, the number five. Uh, means the, the manufacturer ID. Uh, each manufacturer who plans to sell the product to the Korea, uh, they, have to, they have to be registered with the KCC and a unique identification ID uh, or it's called designee code is issued for, for the manufacturer which consists of the three letters and or numbers. Uh, I've, been, I've been talking about this, uh, how MEC can help uh, with your product approval in Korea. Uh, this slide kind of summarizes that. I will very briefly go over that. Uh, MEC has a very active presence in South Korea. We have uh, uh, we have our in-country manager uh, uh, who can support you. Uh, the inquiries can be sent to Peter Kim. His information is on this uh, PowerPoint. Uh, he can not only help you uh, with the approval process, he can help you uh, provide uh, uh, or arrange uh, testing services if you choose to do testing in Korea. However, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for large number of products, uh, if uh, your product falls under uh, the definition of the phase one, uh, you do not need to perform in-country testing. As a cab, uh, MEC performs testing. Uh, our reports are accepted by the Korean authorities and based on the review of our reports, and the information about provided by uh, the manufacturer, uh, we can help uh, achieve our uh, customers uh, get the get the Korean approval. In addition, MEC has uh, MOU signed with the, the Korean labs we mentioned, and uh, if need be, these labs can, we can help arrange uh, coordinated uh, testing uh, by these labs, especially with the safety and or telecommunication aspect of the testing, if need there be. Uh, I mentioned this webpage where all the information is uh, present. It's uh, uh, rra.go.korea. Uh, 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 once again, this webpage has the detailed information about Korean approval, product signs, what kind of testing they have to go through, and a portion of this uh, page also has a link to the latest Korean uh, requirements. Uh, Sometimes many of these requirements may not be are translated to the English language already. Uh, next country which I want to cover is Japan. Uh, Japan recently signed a MRA with the United States. Uh, before the MRA was signed, uh, uh, due to the due to the uh, due to an MOU signed between the United States and uh, Japan uh, for IDE products, uh, United the labs in US were already allowed to perform testing. Uh, and issue reports for VCCI, which only covers the ITE product. However, when a U.S. manufacturer wanted to sell the radio products to Japan, they would have to go through uh, the approval process or certification with the bodies. Uh, there are, there were, there still are some non-government bodies in Japan, uh, which will perform the testing and issue the certificates on the behalf of Japanese government. Since this MRA has been signed. 
and the labs who are part of this MRA, uh, which are uh, which become certification bodies. Uh, so, if you are going through one of those uh, labs who are part of this MRA, uh, no in-country testing is needed uh, since this MRA is uh, signed uh, signed by uh, by U.S. and the Japanese government. Uh, however, in some cases, even before this MRA was signed. Some labs had the agreements with uh, some of the Japanese uh, authorities, where based on uh, based on the uh, auditing process, in some cases, uh, U.S. labs could still perform testing, uh, and uh, the the Japanese authorities will accept their test results. And based on the review, which was similar to TCB program, uh, they could still issue the uh, certification. Okay. Uh, next country I want to go over is Taiwan. Uh, there are two main bodies uh, which cover the compliance and or approvals for Taiwan, uh, namely NCC, which is National Communication Commission, and the second one is BSMI, uh, Bureau of Standards and Metrology Inspection. Uh, BSMI covers the ITE aspect of the testing, whereas NCC covers the radio and or telecommunication products. So if your products fall under uh, the first two categories uh, mentioned on my PowerPoint, uh, your product will have to go through the approval process by NCC. Otherwise, uh, your product uh, will have to go through uh, BSMI. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier during my, uh, uh, during my slide, which I had about the phase one MRAs, uh, both NCC and BSMI are part of the uh, uh, the MRA process. In other words, uh, the U.S. lab could choose to become a CAB both for NCC and or BSMI if they choose to do so. Uh, NCC approval process, uh, which covers telecom and the radio aspect of the testing or radio function of the testing. Testing would have to be done by uh, CAB uh, if the testing is being done in U.S. And uh, the EMC portion of the testing would have to be done by the uh, done by uh, the CAP to the uh, to the CNS standards. Uh, just to mention that these CNS standards are very very similar to the uh, equivalent uh, IC or CISPR standards. Uh, in many cases, uh, the safety testing also applies. Uh, and uh, the trick to go through the BSM uh, to NCC process is that the test report should not be older than two years, you know, in those cases, uh, the, uh, Vietnam, uh, the, the Taiwanese authorities may request you to go back and re-perform the testing. On the other hand, uh, for BSMI, which we mentioned earlier, uh, covers only the IT products. There are two, the two schemes for the compliance, RPC, which is the registration, and the other one is the component of the IT products, like the computer boards or motherboards or uh, the PCMCA cards, so on and so forth. Uh, the BSMI process uh, involves testing being done by a CAB who is part of the Phase 1 MRA. Testing has to be done to the uh, Taiwanese, uh, my apologies, uh, Vietnamese, I sincerely apologize, uh, BSMI uh, standards which go by CNS standards. Uh, testing has to be done for both safety and EMC, uh, whereas safety may not be applicable in all cases. Uh, uh, once the testing has to be done, uh, the report has to be submitted uh, to the appropriate channels uh, for the for the formal for the formal approval. Uh, in the next slide, I want to uh, go a little deeper about the BSMI approval process and some of the key challenges uh, the manufacturer uh, has to go through, manufacturer and the lab has to go through uh, while they are going through the BSMI approval process. Uh, a brief update before I jump into uh, some of those challenges I mentioned. Uh, with the recent update, uh, the radio emission testing uh, is now required uh, beyond 1 gigahertz uh, in an effort to harmonize the European requirement. Now the testing is required up to 6 gigahertz. The biggest challenge with the BSMI is that there are so many unwritten rules uh, which cause significant problems not only for the labs, conformity assessment bodies, and also for the manufacturers. Uh, we recently learned while trying to sort out some problems, uh, which not only uh, us, but many labs like us uh, in US 
uh, run, in, run into very frequently, we recently learned that uh, above and beyond the CNS standards which are required by uh, BSMI, BSMI holds uh, regular meetings with the local lab, by local I mean the labs in, in Taiwan, which go over the testing needs and oftentimes uh, the, uh, some memorandums are released after those meetings where changes to the testing requirements are proposed and are, uh, are proposed in a way that BSMI authorities take them as requirements. For example, uh, one of the requirements is that testing has to be done at, uh, for, uh, for telecom interfaces uh, like Ethernet, testing has to be done at three different databases. Uh, when this requirement came out, this requirement was not published by BSMI. This requirement was not shared with NIST in the United States. As NIST didn't know anything about this requirement, NIST obviously did not share this requirement with the the US CAS, and when the reports were submitted to uh, BSMI authorities uh, after, te after testing was done, uh, in many cases these reports were tossed back requesting testing to be done at three different rates, and when this request was challenged, uh, then they were told, well, this is a new rule. Uh, however, this rule is not documented anywhere. Uh, now, based on this information, uh, NIST is trying to, trying to coordinate uh, with BSMI and try to set up uh, some way uh, that those notes of the meetings or memos which are issued after the local CAB meetings in Taiwan, uh, they are also released to with the, after the translation to the U.S. labs. So the U.S. labs are also up to date of uh, these ever-changing requirements so that we could provide a better service to, uh, to our customers. Uh, a brief uh, mention about the Met in Taiwan. Met is a very Met, Met has a very active presence in uh, both China and Taiwan. Our in-country contact is Jesu, who is the general manager of our HE operations. Uh, Met obviously is uh, part of the uh, Phase One MRA for uh, as a CAS for the SMI, where we perform the testing to the uh, the SMI requirements, and based on our test reports issued. Uh, we can either help our, our customers to get them the approval or they can take our report and go directly to the, the, uh, to the uh, BSMI authorities uh, to seek the approval. Uh, these two references uh, are very helpful. They, have, uh, uh, they, they, provide, uh, they provide a lot of information uh, about uh, the approved labs and uh, uh, what are the standards and uh, which categories the product fall into, so on and so forth. Uh, we are really uh, getting to the point where I have to, I may have to skip some of the countries, but I will try to cover as much as I can uh, uh, at this point. So the, the next one I want to take up is the Vietnam. Uh, the major change for the Vietnam is that as of August 2011, ICTQC has been replaced by VNTA, where VNTA is the Vietnamese Telecommunication Authority. The approval process pretty much follows uh, the same footsteps as many other nations, where radio and telecommunication devices require type approvals, where, uh, and uh, the IDE product requires just the registration. Uh, MATLAB, being a uh, cab under the Phase 1 MRA, can perform testing to uh, the EMC and or the radio functions and uh, testing is done to the applicable TCN standards and this report should not be older than two years and uh, after the testing is done, uh, Matt issues the report, Matt can help to our partners in Vietnam uh, to get to uh, uh, our, our uh, the manufacturers uh, get the approval uh, for, for Vietnam. Uh, this doublink uh, provides a significant information about the uh, approval process uh, and the some of the requirements for uh, Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese authorities. Uh, the next country I want to mention is the Singapore. Uh, for IT product, there is no specific requirement. Uh, several years ago, uh, 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 IDA, IDA had a specific standard to cover the IT product. However, since then they have required the standard. 
since this uh, new uh, reorganization uh, was posted on their website. Now the products will fall under, which fall under radio equipment or telecommunication equipment, which requires the registration. Uh, the EMC requirements are spelled under these radio and or telecommunication uh, registration products. Uh, India. India is a growing economy. Uh, uh, India has uh, a very well defined uh, approval uh, processes in place today. Uh, radio devices has to go through uh, WPC uh, type approval. Uh, in many cases, WPC will accept the testing done to uh, the European uh, radio standards or the FC standards uh, with some deviations. Our telecommunication equipment has to go through our TEC uh, approval process. Our TEC testing uh, could be done to uh, both, uh, uh, my apologies, TEC, TEC testing is uh, classified as interface approval and also the, uh, the, the type approval. The TEC interface approval uh, involves testing done by a qualified approved lab. Testing does not necessarily have to be done in, in India. Testing could be done by the labs in US and uh, at other nations. Testing is performed to the EMC and telecommunication uh, requirements. Testing is done to the TEC, uh, the applicable TEC document. At the moment, the applicable document is, uh, the latest version is TEC slash EMI slash TEL dash 001, which is of February 09. Uh, testing requirements are very, very similar to the European EMC requirement. However, some of the test requirements go way beyond the European requirements. For example, uh, the radiator susceptibility testing requires uh, to go up to 6 gigahertz, uh, and the testing has to be done at uh, 10 volts per meter. At the same time, uh, the, uh, uh, the vo uh, voltage dips and interrupts, interrupts requirements are way more stringent than the, uh, uh, the, uh, the harmonized uh, European requirements. After the testing is done and uh, the report has been prepared by the lab, uh, MET labs can help to our partners uh, prepare a package uh, to submit to the Indian authorities and help you get through the approval process. Uh, very briefly, I will mention some of the uh, Middle Eastern countries. Many of these, uh, many of these nations uh, require radio, uh, require type approval for radio equipment and or telecommunication equipment uh, like uh, United, uh, UAE, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, some of these countries also have additional EMC requirements, but their EMC requirements are uh, uh, are based on the European requirements. In other words, testing done to the European requirements uh, will be accepted. However, our test reports have to be submitted along with the equipment uh, information uh, to the authorities uh, in these nations. Uh, for example, in many cases, it's the uh, Ministry of Information uh, and the uh, information and the communication, especially in the United States, uh, Bahrain, Qatar, and uh, and Saudi Saudi Arabia. Uh, the approval process is fairly, fairly simple. Uh, the next one, uh, as I mentioned, is Saudi Arabia. Goes exactly on the same line. Uh, the very next one will be the Kuwait. Uh, again, process is very similar. Testing would have to be done by uh, would testing would have to be done for telecommunication and or uh, radio equipment. Uh, testing could be done to the European requirement and uh, for the type approval. Uh, the test reports along with the other information package appropriate uh, applicable to your product kind will have to be submitted to, to Ministry of Information and the Communication uh, uh, for, for quit. Uh, I have a few other countries uh, like uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Israel, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, however, the process is fairly simple and if uh, if the listeners uh, are interested in knowing more about those nations, uh, we will be very glad to share uh, the PDF version of our presentation with you where you can have more information. And that uh, PDF uh, will also provide uh, valuable links uh, and contact information for those nations which unfortunately due to the 
time constraints I could not cover today. So at this point, I'm going to uh, stop my presentation and I will uh, give it back to Benavi. And if you guys have any questions, uh, we can go ahead and proceed. Yes, thank you, Asad. Uh, uh, just real quick, a copy of this webinar will be available on netlabs.com. We will send a follow-up email with a link to this file. Now we will answer questions. We already have a few. If you have a question, please type it in the questions area of your control panel. For questions we can easily address now, we will read the question aloud, then give a verbal answer. Okay, uh, my apologies for the slight pause there. Uh, one of the question is, uh, do we have any information on the certification for Latin America? Uh, we do have partners in Latin America. Through those partners, uh, we can facilitate the uh, compliance for uh, many of the nations in the uh, Latin American countries. Uh, the good news there is that uh, U.S. and Mexico government at the moment are in talks uh, on signing an MRA, which will cover uh, the EMC aspect of the testing along with the telecommunication and others. Uh, once that MRA is in place, uh, uh, it, the, the process will become a lot more open and simple where testing would be done in the United States and uh, the authorities in the Latin American countries, especially in Mexico, they will accept our results. Uh, talking about uh, other uh, Latin American countries uh, like uh, uh, Brazil, uh, Brazil, in some cases, uh, allow testing to be done in US by U.S. labs on case-by-case -case basis. Uh, that is something which has to be explored with the lab of your choice and the uh, authorities in Brazil uh, to see if they will allow or they will give the approval. However, in some cases, Brazilian authorities allow that to happen. Uh, now the next question is, uh, what is the, uh, I think, I believe this question is more in terms of the uh, BSMI requirement of uh, uh, three data rates. And the question is, what if the interface uh, has only one or two data rates? Uh, so the simple answer is that uh, we will state in the report uh, that testing has to be done only the data rates which are supported by the software and the hardware on the product. If there are other data rates which are not supported, uh, we will uh, simply state in the report that uh, based on the hardware limitation, that feature has, is 